Good afternoon, everybody. I think we can start. We are on time, perfectly on time, three o'clock. So I'm uh, Ilaria Viarengo. I'm uh, the head of the Department of International Studies and uh, I'm professor of international law. Actually, I have a course in international human rights law. And uh, first of all, I would like to, to, to thank uh, the organizers of uh, this conference, in particular, Professor Alessandra Facchi for inviting me. Uh, it's, uh, and I would like also to take this chance to congratulate with Alessandra and with Nicola Riva for this wonderful uh, project. And uh, it's really, uh, I'm really honored and very happy indeed to uh, chair this panel, which regards the principle of equality. The principle of equality is a fundamental element of international human rights law recognized in all human rights instruments. And it is also a cornerstone of the European integration process. Nonetheless, it is a, a, a complex principle, a multifaceted principle, uh, with the most challenging implication and different dimensions. Therefore, we really look uh, forward to hearing from uh, our uh, keynote speaker, Professor Zanetti, about this principle. Professor Zanetti is a, a professor of uh, um, Filosofia del Diritto, I don't know how you translate Filosofia del Diritto in English, and Teoria dell'Argomentazione Normativa uh, at the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia and is also uh, the uh, director, the president of the CRID, Centro di Ricerca Interdepartimentale su Discriminazione e Vulnerabilità. So please, Professor Zanetti, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. Of course, as is customary, I must start thanking the, um, Professor Alessandra Facchi, Professor Nicola Riva, and above all, all Paola Parolari for organizing this event. Uh, I have been uh, the slave, sorry, I meant to say the chair assistant of Professor Enrico Pattaro for 10 years, and I organized myself several of such events, and I know the amazing amount of work that is behind all of this. So thank you very much for what you did. Even if we cannot be completely aware of that, uh, we are certainly grateful. Now, uh, I also, th I, I will not thank you for the particular position that I have, because after the, the, the two lectures given this morning, uh, everything will be kind of anti-climatic. And also I am now under the difficult toll order by Andreas Niederberger. I must be careful not to turn the value of equality in a meta value superior to the others. So this is kind of a challenge now. Um, well, uh, equality, yes, is sometimes labeled one of those. Can you, can you hear me? Uh, can you? Can you hear me? We, we, we are facing a problem. Closer to me? No. Farther? Better now? OK. I didn't say anything relevant, although I know that, that Andreas could understand what I said because he was laughing when I mentioned his name. So equality is kind of one of those essentially contested concepts, so a notion which about which even a radical disagreement uh, is not simply or necessarily the outcome of lack of clarity and precision or lack of intellectual honesty. It is a notion that evolved in such a way that it implies some form of disagreement as a constitutive possibility of its discussion horizon. So it's not bad to disagree about equality because it's part and parcel of the way equality works. Uh, in our Italian constitution, we do have Article 3, where we find kind of hints of two different kind of equalities. There is a formal equality, which is equality before the law, uh, against any discrimination as far as sex, uh, and language and religion is concerned. But then there is a hint to a different kind of equality, which is kind of interesting, is a more substantial equality, uh, the lack of which could 
prevent citizens from enjoying effective participation in the political, economic, and political organization of the country. The latter notion has to do with some kind of distributive justice problem. So it's not just formal justice before the law, something different from some points of view. And, as it is well known, the Charter of Fundamental Right simply states that everyone is equal before the law, Article 20, and then deals with non-discrimination issues, key kinds of diversity, and specifically there is emphasis about with the equality between men and women. And Article 24, 25, and 26, however, I remember they introduce uh, within the same chapter three about equality, the rights of the child, of the elderly, of people with disabilities, rights that, as we shall see, imply a reasonable allocation of financial resources. So this is something that should be kept in mind. It should be remarked that such a distinction is useful. I mean, formal equality, substantial equality, of course it's useful. By the way, I apologize because of my bad, broken English. I know my pronunciation is funny. My, my American students uh, would say that they like my, they enjoy my cute accent, and they always hated that patronizing attitude, but I'm sure that you can understand what I'm saying. Uh, this, yes, this distinction is useful, but it's also dangerous because it could lull us hastily into some kind of intellectual laziness, into the sin of intellectual laziness, as if there were a nice sharp line between the two kinds of equality. The way sometimes we distinguish, there were interesting hints this morning, between civil or political rights on one hand and social rights on the other hand, and, and of course, all what we need uh, to make sure we can enjoy our civil and political rights is a liberal ruler, uninterested in curbing our freedom, while social rights are, alas, so expensive, so difficult to implement, and so on. Now, um, the contemporary debate has since long recognized that such a reassuring picture is what it is, a picture, a beam of light that sheds light on some corner of the problem, which is perfectly okay, uh, but leaving other corners of the problem in the darkness. And for instance, uh, Kassustein and, and Stephen Holmes uh, uh, famously uh, stressed uh, that, that uh, civil rights and political rights are implemented spending taxpayers' money just like those socialism-tainted social rights. And, uh, he has a Swiftian proposal, a proposal that can remind the sense of humor of Jonathan Swift to celebrate uh, tax paying day. And South America, Gardon Valdez harped on the same uh, notes, I remember. Now, uh, we must also accept that if, if we look at the location of resources, taking care of social rights uh, is much more expensive. Uh, in European countries than taking care of other important political issues. But, but there is a, a, a famous celebrated uh, paradox that can be traced all the way back to ancient Greek that can help us to frame the problem in a different light, even as maybe in a more entertaining way. Uh, it's the famous sorites or heap paradox. It's, it's very simple. Uh, a man with no hair is bald. A man with one hair is certainly bald. With two hair is still certainly bald. When can we claim that we are in our hand that final hair adding which we can no longer predicate baldness of that head? We cannot tell because many factors can play a crucial role. Or maybe the shape of the face, whatever, the color of the hair, whatever. So it's still true that a man with no hair at all is bald, plain and simple. Now, uh, let us suppose, for as a mind experiment, 
a situation of extravagant inequality. A theoretical maximum divergence in point of distributive justice. Let us suppose that in a given country, all the wealth is in the hands of a single person, a man or a woman. All the landed property, the means of production, all the cash and the assets, uh, the real estate, of course, are his or hers. It's highly doubtful that in such a scenario, political and civil rights can flourish or even survive. There are simply no available resources to pay judges and lawyers or to organize elections, to, to prevent intimidation from blackmail or to generate security. So the Soviet paradox come now in handy. What if all the wealth is in the hands of two people, not just one? What if it is legally owned, legally owned, legitimately owned, not by a single person, but by a single family? What if it is not all the wealth whatsoever that is in the hands of a single person, but only the means of, of production, or all the media, newspapers, TV, internet providers, what if it is not all the wealth, but maybe only 98%, 95%? You see, while the notion of wealth from a logical and, as it were, abstract point of view enjoys a certain degree of autonomy, it is not impossible to be poor and wealthy, to be poor and endowed with leadership skills, or poor and wise and learned. Well, even if it is not impossible, such a notion is also wealth, historically linked in interesting and different ways with other spheres of human practical flourishing. It is increasingly difficult to be poor and healthy. It is increasingly difficult to be poor and in a position of leadership, poor and competent. Uh, by the way, uh, I have to thank Nicole Arriva for some very bright and helpful remarks that he gave me into a previous discussion. Um, well, this mind experiment serves only one purpose, to restate the obvious. So first and foremost, there is somewhere a line in the sand, and beyond that line, distributive justice problem, substantial inequality, can jeopardize formal equality itself, can become a problem. Uh, deep social inequalities can affect legal and political equality. Second, in our culture, uh, and that can be traced all the way back to John Locke, of course, the second treatise, uh, we can say that that line in the sand is far away. We can allow strong inequalities. Locke says disproportionate inequalities. So, you know, there's no need to be egalitarian in a strong way. You know, strong inequalities in our liberal culture are certainly allowed. Number three, and I'm still restating the obvious, it is clear that this line in the sand cannot be recognized by a standard computation. You remember Plato two millennia and a half ago, almost, uh, he would say, oh, the richest man cannot be five times richer than the poorest. You know, it was a very practical thing to say. It was very simple. Well, we do not have that luxury. There is no uh, standard computation that grants us the possibility to detect the moment of risk for our liberal political institution, because so many factors can play a role. The Barkian manners of a population, Edmund Barker, the mainstream religion, the attitude of neighboring nations, and so on, are all factors that can impact the final result. Uh, fourth, and most problematic, if that line exists, I'm asking you, is there any duty, obligation, necessity, or even convenience in trying to detect its location? I mean, its temporary location, its situated location. Uh, I submit that there is such a political duty. 
uh, if it is acknowledged that macro inequalities can theoretically be incompatible, theoretically be incompatible with the simple regular workings of a liberal democracy, then a liberal democracy should be interested in knowing when it is time to be concerned, when there is a red flag, even if it is utterly impossible to answer this question in a conclusive and reassuring way. I'm telling you, there are questions which are perfectly reasonable even if you cannot answer them in a conclusive way. Uh, a few days ago, I mean, in his, his life, there is nothing bad talking about that, I asked two doctors about my mother, who is very old and demented, and they asked uh, which kind of life expectancy I, must, I can imagine for her. And one of them said, oh, you, we, you can tell every case is different. You cannot ask such questions. Maybe you and I will die before your mother because we can, could have a car accident. Very wise and patronizing. And, and the second one said, hey, listen, uh, yeah, it's difficult to tell, but I would say that I would be surprised that in, if in five years she's still alive. I thanked the latter one and I didn't like at all the first one, because there, is, there are questions which cannot be answered in a conclusive way and that still make a lot of sense. And we should ask ourselves when strong inequalities from the distributive, point of, uh, uh, the distributive justice point of view become dangerous even for formal equality, even for, you understand my point. And this means that to speak of equality is to pe speak of complex problems. Because equality from this point of view, from the point of view of distributive justice, is kind of an intricate subject. And this has to, to do with the extreme point reached by current world inequalities, inequalities. Now, I'm not going to be boring. I'm not giving you all the data. Uh, no, I will, I will tackle this from a different point of view. Otherwise, that would be extremely boring. Um, you see, on the one hand, there are peaks of wealth that are not even understandable beyond the point of a mathematical comprehension. Uh, I, I tried to speak with my colleagues of the Department of Economics and I couldn't really understand. There are amounts of financial wealth that simply seem digits on a screen. One does not even know what you could do with that amount of money, uh, what you could purchase, what you could accomplish. You cannot buy a planet, even if Cecil Rhodes famously stated that he would have loved to, to to colonize a planet. Everybody knows because Hannah Arendt, that was mentioned today, uh, uh, quoted the famous sentence by Cecil Rhodes. This is the peak of wealth. On the other hand, lack of wealth can be quite sanguine and obscenely corporeal. It can affect bodies in the most brutal physical meaning of the word. It can mean cruel deaths and painful, usually short lives. Human beings can be trafficked, exploited to death, and sold. And this is, however, only one side of the problem. And a quick, cha quick change of perspective uh, uh, can, can let us see things from a completely different point of view. There was a time when rich men could enjoy an extravagant, way of life, spectacularly rich. Uh, Croesus, king of Lydia and Polycrates, tyrant of Samos, as in the histories by Herodotus, till, uh, what was the name, William Randolph Hearst. I don't know if any of you have ever been in the Tacky Mansion in California, cl close to the Big Sur, the California castle of Hearst, Hearst Castle. It's incredible. There is a swimming pool that is as big as the neighborhood where I live. I mean, it really makes no sense. However, there was a limit at all of this, a limit that was the allotted time you had to enjoy it, because money could not buy safety from old age and diseases. Now, the current rise in life expectancy, which is a 
critical factor to understand of what is going on. Due to the extraordinary advance of geriatric medicine, implies that if and only if you are very rich, you can enjoy sometimes 20 years, sometimes 30 years of quality life. If, with, with two Fs, if and only if. This is a treasure that no millionaire of the past could have ever even dreamed of. I remember that Federigo the gambler, created by the pen of Prospero Merime, out of free wishes, he asked one about wealth, he was always winning when he plays cards, he's a gambler, but the other two is about extending his life expectancy, extending the days of his life. And this means that because of such an available but very expensive treasure, the inequality divergence can be more extreme than it has ever been. The wealthy elitist of the movie Elysium with Jodie Forster, who can afford futuristic health technology, are already born, although they, for the time being they don't seem inclined to, to live in a secluded environment. Uh, in other words, the claim that all human beings have the right to live the natural course of their life, as for instance, Martha Nussbaum famously deduced from her capabilities approach, is a tall order. And even more so in the light of Article 25 of the Charter, the Union recognizes and respects the rights of the elderly to lead a life of dignity and independence. This touches kind of the subtlest aspects of the Western notion of equality. And this links the problem of equality with a controversial notion of anthropology. You know, when you say human beings, all human beings, it's never that easy, of course. When Bartolome Las Casas thought that the Indios were full-fledged human beings, while, of course, uh, Juan Quines de Sepulveda thought they were just homuncoli, not true human beings. And there are still some controversies sometimes, especially in bioethics. But all what I want to say is that even if we do have a shared notion of human beings, uh, that simply means that we have available what Jeremy Waldron would call a basic, a notion of basic equality among them. That means the idea that human beings are equal from a relevant point of view, which is compelling. Maybe because they share the same DNA, or because they are all children of God, or because they are all endowed with logos, kind of a discursive kind of reason. There was a wonderful conference in Switzerland, Lugano, at the Faculty of Theology, Human Rights and Christianity. It was all about this uh, equality issue from Adam. They, they were very much taken by this, this problem of human rights. Now, these basic equality assumptions are never neutral because they seem to be good premises for normative equality arguments. It's very simple. I mean, if human beings are equal, they should be treated as equals or equally, let's say with equal concern and respect, as Ronald Walkin would put it. The end result uh, tends to be that, I quote, any, any discrimination shall be prohibited, Article 21. Now, this is interesting because the conceptual itinerary from basic equality to normative equality is very reassuring. It keeps us in a comfort zone. Since we are equal, we should be treated with equal concern and respect. There should be no discrimination. Since men and women are equal, we should treat them the same way. Basic equality is a premise, a prius, not a prize, a cause, an assumption. Well, normative equality, the argument, is a consequence, a posterius, an effect, 
a conclusion. It's simple and in plain. Why should I complain? Uh, this scheme is to be found, for instance, in the famous Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, I, 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 it's the only quote. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creature with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Equally first, then, you know, all men are created equal. And it's basic equality. They are equal, they are created equal. The problem is that, I submit, notion of basic equality are themselves cultural constructions of the most valuable kind, and they can be the outcome of practices of normative equality. And this mean is kind of counterintuitive. I understand this is kind of counterintuitive. That is so, it can be important to us that it's possible to conceptualize basic equality as an effect, not as a cause, as a posterius, not as a prius, as an outcome, a point of arrival. Well, maybe it's better to start from inequality. I own this to our Professor Alessandra Facchi. She hinted to me that Jeremy Bentham already knew that law and legal institution can actually make women different and weaker. Okay, this tie is the tie of the Carabinieri army. I don't teach only at the Department of Jurisprudence, I also teach at the Military Academy. I perfectly remember when ladies, when women were not allowed to serve in the army, to be Carabinieri cadets. It, with my great pleasure, I saw the arrival of women cadets. The problem is that if I do not allow women to practice manly sports, since I'm recorded, I hope that, that the scare quotes are mentioned, uh, you know, their body will not develop the necessary muscle structure, for instance, or they will not get used to summon the necessary adrenaline when it's time to fight and to struggle. Uh, at that point, it will be easy to say that they are different from a natural point of view, that they should be forbidden to practice those activities because they are different, while it can be argued that it's the other way around. If I forbid them to uh, practice those sports, to, to, to get involved in those activities, I will make them uh, kind of different and weaker. Uh, I, so it is interesting because the charter of the European values is first and foremost an act of normative equality. It is about prohibitions, Article 21, commitment to respect diversity, Article 22, foreseeing measures providing specific advantages, very important, Article 23, or commitment to care for a well-being. So some kind of basic equality will be necessarily the outcome of such practices, of these legal provisions that will, which can radiate from all of this. And it will not be anything carved in stone, but obviously disregard for this kind of value, disregard for the value of equality conceived in this way, and enshrined in the charter, can have, could have, the worst kind of consequences. Well, if European institutions treat migrants or refugees as potential criminals, as very often is the case in my country, they will certainly create the cultural and normative conditions that may turn those men and women into unequal men and women from a basic equality point of view. It is, as it is well known, 
always possible to enact laws that only look egalitarian, abstract and general, like those liberal laws mentioned by Anatole France, that would, would be everybody, everybody, the same way, the rich and the poor alike, the citizen and the migrant alike, to sleep under the bridges. Obviously, rich citizens have no need to sleep under the bridges. Law, in other words, implies and reinforces a narrative of equality and of inequality, of basic equality and inequality. So to speak of equality, therefore, means to speak of who and what we truly are, and of who and what we can be, of who and what we can be forbidden to be or to become. Now, this itinerary from normative equality to basic equality is, as I said, counterintuitive. One of the reasons that it can be deemed as counterintuitive could lie in our, uh, for several points of view, wonderful Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, I mentioned the, 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 the seminar, the conference in Lugano. It was always about going from basic equality, we are all children of an almighty God, uh, to normative equality, therefore human rights. Uh, in this tradition, the first example of uh, the different itinerary from, from normative equality to basic equality is not a nice page of human history. Uh, the first time is the serpent who says, Eritis uh, sicut Deus, scientes bonum ac malum. And that was a line very much loved by Wolfgang Goethe. Uh, you will be equal to God if you disobey. Disobedience is a normative, can be a normative practice. And, and if you do that, you will become equal to God. But you know the consequences in this case were quite unfortunate. Uh, but this is interesting. This could be one of the reasons we are not truly comfortable with this alternative itinerary. However, if the conceptual itinerary from normative equality to basic equality makes sense, then we can draw some sobering conclusions. We are almost at the end. You know, the reason I'm, I'm telling this is that when I served in the army, they told me that there is an attention graph. At the beginning, attention cannot be very strong, uh, but then if the teacher, the lecturer, sacrifices a little bit of his dignity, the, 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 the attention goes up, reaches a peak, but then it necessarily starts to go down. You, you can be William Shakespeare, Cicero, but it will happen. Close to the end of the lesson or of the lecture, uh, attention has a spike. It goes up, probably because people want to maximize uh, the, the, the time that they have wasted or invested. And so I'm telling you, we are almost at the end, so maybe you know, it can trigger a spike of attention. Not that it's really necessary, but it's always good to say when we are close to the end. Uh, yes. Yes, there is no doubt about this. Uh, normative equality is, from this point of view, first and foremost, a practice. A practice. And this is kind of a sobering conclusion. Uh, it can take place within a legislative organ, enacting a statute that prevents discrimination, or in a court of justice, ruling in a way that implements some kind of equality, but also by demonstrating on the streets, by political activism and civil commitment. These are normative practices. By acts of civil disobedience, oh, by saving human beings drawing the Mediterranean Sea. That helps us to see things from a different point of view. The idea is that some kind of inequality and discrimination is first perceived as such, and that these painful circumstances trigger some kind of practice of normative equality that will create, in turn, a new kind 
of basic equality. So that we can say something obvious. We can say, for instance, that migrants' lives matter. In the US, they say something different. But the notion is a notion of equality. Now, it is interesting because uh, there is uh, an Italian author, a philosopher of the Baroque period, that was actually able to detect this problem in an almost prophetic way. His name was Giambattista Vico. He wrote in a very convoluted and difficult Italian. The English translation is so much better. Uh, and and in, in Vico's representation, there are these plebeians, this family, which are serfs, they are considered almost belonging to another species. They are completely inferior, and they fight. Since they, they cannot stand their situation, they, find, they fight for human rights, for their rights, and for full citizenship. And at the, big, at the end, uh, they become equal to the patricians, and they can be deemed equal to their former masters that, after all, uh, were not landed on earth from heaven, non esse a cielo de missus. Now, there is a little problem that I want to, under, uh, to stress, to put emphasis on. Plebeians ask for a universal equality. No one should be excluded in Vico's reconstruction. However, equality between men and women was never mentioned, neither by their family, the servants, the plebeians, nor by Vico. A trifle, half of the population. A, a trifle, a little fly in the ointment, they were simply not mentioned because the detected perceived inequality was only that between male patricians and male plebeians. Uh, equality, and this is the trick, uh, must each time claim to be universal. You cannot say equality just for us. There is a famous African-American piece of wisdom that I find it very amusing. They say, when white men say justice, what they mean is just us. Uh, and, 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 and yes, uh, and yes, these uh, uh, um, plebeians say, say universal equality, not for women. Women had no equality whatsoever. There is no such things as universal equality. There are only practices of normative equality that under different circumstances, after having detected different kinds of inequality and discrimination, reshape the notion of basic equality implied in those different norms, institution, and practices, which means equality is a therapy, actually different kinds of therapy for different kinds of diseases, is not a state of good health. Equality, yeah, I'm, I'm, this comes from great professor in Tilbury, Hans Lindahl, uh, equality is always equal, equ equalitas equans, the process of equality, is not e equalitas equata, a perfect state of things. There will be always somebody which forgot about. There are always some, some, some people who are somehow left out. There is always somebody left out. Uh, this bottom-up Yes, this bottom-up notion of equality implies, however, that its workings cannot rely exclusively on traditional institutions like parliament and court of justice. In fact, I mentioned civil commitment, uh, demos, political activism. Such institutions can do wonders, but they can also mirror biases and prejudices of the majority are critically sharing its narrative of basic equality and inequalities, deaf to the cry of those who are left out. While there is no magic wand that can prevent this from happening, there are possible remedies. And this is the last step of my presentation. 
uh, is a very simple Mughal philosophy distinction. I found it the last time I was in Kwame Anthony Hapia, who teaches at, at Princeton. He's black. Mughal philosophy distinguishes sometimes between primary interests and critical interests. It's very simple. I have a primary desire to eat, to eat dark chocolate because I love dark chocolate. But I have a critical desire, a critical interest in not eating chocolate because of health issues. Or maybe because I just want to uh, keep in good shape, you know, to look pretty. I mean, it, it doesn't need to be a lofty uh, value. Well, there can be a tension between primary interests and critical interests. Uh, and a critical interest actually partially defines my own identity. So what can I do? Well, I can ask those who are in charge to shop for groceries not to buy any dark chocolate. Later, when the desire will sting, it will be hard. But luckily, hopefully, I will be able to keep a good shape because I will not eat of the forbidden, not fruit, but uh, food. Same thing, other people, Italians, Europeans, can critically decide that they want to honor compassion and solidarity. They do not want to discriminate the lot of the poor and of the marginalized. They want to take care of the current migrant and refugee crisis. They are in favor of taking seriously these issues and to have shelters for homeless, maybe Europeans or migrants, meeting points where they can have access to legal resources in order to be aware of their rights. When I heard Professor Luigi Palombella's presentation this morning, I thought, well, maybe a connection with the migrants' problem is uh, legal clinics, because legal clinics is exactly what allows grants from the efficient point of view to migrants, the possibility to have access to justice. People will tell them which are their rights if they have a case and how can they actually implement them. So, you know, there are connections here. Yes, now, of course, there is a dark side. Such shelters, such meeting points, such institutions. Uh, can be of no comfort to those Europeans, to those Italians, to happen to live, for instance, in the street where the shelter is. For instance, real estate price can be impacted to begin with. And then there are security problems, blah, blah. The primary desire, the primary desire, is therefore to get rid of these kind of problems. Not in my backyard, please. We don't want them here. <coughs> But there could be an association of activists, a university institution, acknowledged by the legal system, whose only goal is to make sure that those migrants or homeless people can get that shelter, that legal resources, and so on, no matter what therefore implementing and realizing European values. These groups, these sessions, these institutions do not care too much about the real estate price fluctuations. And while political institutions, reactive as they are to mainstream consensus, could become easily deaf to the cries of the vulnerable and of those left out, fearful as they are of punishment at the next electoral round, such a private association could be adamant, thereby realizing the critical interest of those European institutions that by a collective decision shaped in the Charter of Fundamental Right, value and cherish an European identity as a hospitable and compassionate country. So in order to validate equality as a practice, it has the value of such a complex notion of equality, 
it becomes critical to let such agencies and institutions flourish because we could be blind to new forms of inequality and discrimination. Sometimes vulnerabilities, inequalities are hidden, I know that they're not the same thing, are hidden in plain sight, like the purloined letter of Edgar Allan Poe, they are sometimes invisible just because they are in front of our nose. It is so easy to be prey of biases and prejudice when the current European migration and refugee crisis is at stake. So for this reason, this equality is nothing positive, substantial, is a critical category that basically, first and foremost, urges us to stay away from the most unacceptable cases of discrimination in order to be not deaf to the cry of those who grow weary of unequal treatment and to be able to deal with the tension between formal equality and substantial equality. On these problems, the philosophical debate of equality has recently landed, and therefore on these problems, uh, I end my presentation now, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Zanetti. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I can't. Why don't you use my Thank you. Thank you for your most interesting presentation. Actually, I'm also professor at the Military Academy in Rome. I have had a course in human rights for 10 years, but I never got a tie. That's discrimination. Anyway, you touch a lot of important issues. On them, I'm sure that Nicola Riva has some remarks. Nicola Riva, everybody knows Nicola. He's professor of philosophy of the Diritto in our university. Please, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, well, it's not easy to discuss uh, uh, Gianfrancesco Zanetti paper because uh, our discussion on equality is some like a, a never-ending story and uh, we, I, we, I think I learned a lot from Francesco on equality and uh, the more we discussed the more I came I think to agree with him and one important thing probably if I uh, have to recognize uh, the more important lessons I uh, received from Francesco which is clear in uh, his paper is the idea that normative practices are always embedded. Francesco likes to speak of uh, bottom-up approaches. I'm not sure that I would use that phrase, but the idea that uh, normative practice and normative concepts and the idea are always the outcomes of uh, fighting for something of struggling for something. So a completely, complete rejection of foundationalist approaches or too abstract approaches. And this is, uh, I think, uh, the central uh, idea of this paper on equality. And uh, on this point, uh, I, I, as I hope it will become clear during my comments, uh, I perfectly agree with him. I think that his paper can be divided into two parts. The first part deals with the distinction between formal and substantial equality, and the second part uh, deals with the, with the link between basic equality and normative equality, or pra normative practice of equality. Uh, I have some comments on these two different topics. As regards the first part, uh, you rightly criticize uh, the too easy distinction between formal and substantial equality uh, by observing that it is not really a dichotomy, but it is uh, a distinction which is a matter of degree. 
to a certain sense. By linking formal equality to civil and political rights and uh, substantial equality to social and economic rights, he says that, uh, quoting Holmes, Sunstein, uh, and all the literature of the cost of liberties, that uh, what uh, in the literature on rights is some, some like, uh, is often said that is that there is a clear uh, analytic distinction between civil and political rights on the one side and social rights on the other, because uh, while civil liberties are negative rights, social rights are positive ones that requires uh, provisions by the state, and you rightly point out as this uh, distinction doesn't work from an analytical point of view, because uh, civil and political rights as well cost. But uh, I th at the same time, I think that this argument is, is a strong argument if you want to reject uh, an analytic distinction, but it's a poor one if you want to argue normatively, because uh, even if uh, civil liberties cost, they cost much less than social rights. It is quite uh, uh, simple to look to the uh, financial document of uh, a state to see how the cost of justice and providing security is, uh, is nothing as compared to the cost of health insurance or uh, provision for poor people, pensions, and so on. So I think that you need uh, some stronger argument to support uh, the importance of substantial equality. And in your paper, you move to claim that uh, uh, some degree of economic uh, inequality can negatively affect uh, civil and political liberties. What is true, I think, I'm not sure that your example of this uh, fictional society where only one person owns uh, all the well uh, available is uh, the right way to argue for that because if we can imagine uh, a country where only one people owns all the wealth, we also can imagine a country where these single people accept to pay the taxes needed to pay to pay for public provisions. So I mean, uh, the point of uh, economic inequality is not uh, the inability to support public service, is uh, the inability to grant individual people as private citizens the resources to live their lives, so private resources uh, to, deci to decide what to do to pursue their aims. In this sense, uh, in your argument about the distinction between formal and substantive equality, you seems to, uh, your intention seems to be to defend uh, economic equality by pointing to the importance of economic equality for legal and political equality. So implicitly, you suggest that uh, economic equality is subordinated to legal and political equality. What can be discussed? I mean, of course, a certain degree of poverty and deprivation can deprive legal and political rights of their value. Okay. But uh, distributive justice shouldn't be reduced to fighting poverty. It is perfectly possible to think of a society with no poverty, but still unjust from a purely distributive justice. So I can understand that probably poverty is a more urgent problem as compared to economic inequality, but I will keep this problem separated and I will try to question whether economic injustice is, economic inequality, sorry for the lapsus, is unjust in itself, not only because of its impact on legal and political. Then we can come to the conclusion, Rawls suggests these possibilities, that uh, what is required to secure the fair value of political rights, okay, requires us to restrict uh, economic inequality more than a conception of economic distribution justice uh, would require, but we shouldn't assume that as a starting point. So that's the first step. 
As regards the second part of your argument, considering the distinction between the, the link between basic equality and normative equality, you suggest, you suggest that we should reverse the order and say that while uh, it is more, more common to argue from basic equality to normative equality, you says that sometimes it is a practice of treating people unequally that produce those very inequality that are used to justify the practice of treating them unequally. In this sense, uh, your concern is not with the, with the relation between basic equality and the practice of treating people equally, but your really real concern is the, with the relation with, uh, with basic inequality or supposed basic inequality and the practice of treating people unequally. Okay, so I perfectly agree uh, with this idea that sometimes what we take as a foundation for an inequality is the product of that inequality. But what I wonder is, if you reverse the order, first question, does it make sense to speak of basic equality? In the sense that that kind of equality is basic in so far as it provides a justification for the practice of inequalities. Otherwise, I would say that your argument becomes an argument between the relationship between normative equality or equality of treatment and equality of result. But equality of result is not necessarily basic inequality. Unless what you are suggesting is to move from a deontological argument to a teleological argument. While the standard argument says that because human beings are equal, basically, they should be treated as equals, deontologic argument, purely deontologic argument, your argument became uh, because treating people as equals is necessary to make them equal, we should treat them as equal. So the equality to be realized is what justify not treating them as equals. But then the problem becomes, why should we make people equals? What justify this, uh, uh, this, this, this prescription? Okay. So I'm not sure that in order to answer that issue, you, sh you can escape the point of the basic equality, of explaining. And the very last point, uh, there's a suggestion to answer to this question, it seems to me, in your paper. In a, you should, I think, distinguish between two kinds of practice of normative equality. The practice of treating people as equal, you refer in the paper as a normative practice of equality in both cases, but they are distinguished practices. The one is the practice of treating people as equals. The other is the practice of fighting for equality. The practice of people which is excluded from equality and fights to be included has a foundational role in justifying the practice of treating people as equals. So they are two different levels. Thank you. Does it work? Does it work? Well, first and foremost, thank you very much, Nicola. It's always such a pleasure to discuss with you. I didn't expect any less. And I will start from, it works, from the second point. I will start with the second point. I will start by the, from the end. Well, yes. Sometimes uh, my real concern Oh gosh, yeah, TV. Sometimes, is okay like this? Okay, sometimes my first concern seems to be inequality, yes. Uh, I remember, yeah, there was in US a uh, legal provision, a, a policy in the army, in the army, it was called uh, don't ask, don't tell. It was about gay people, gay and lesbian people. They would say, you know, you, you cannot come out. You cannot be openly gay and serve in the army. If you are, you are discharged. And the reason for that, the rationale, it was supposed to be, well, first and foremost, that uh, uh, gay men are vulnerable to blackmail, 
So that's uh, vulnerability in the system. And another one that uh, was a problem of a lack of moral virtue. You know, they are not enough virtues, they lack some kind of inner morality, and therefore they should not serve in the army. Now, I find this particularly interesting. President Barack Obama repealed the don't ask, don't tell policy. I remember it vividly. I found it kind of interesting because on the one hand, if I claim that if you are a homosexual, I'm going to discharge you, I am making you by law vulnerable to blackmail. If somebody gets intelligence, if somebody gets knowledge of your sexual orientation, will be able to blackmail because at that point uh, he can use it as a leverage to, to blackmail, to squeeze info from you. Otherwise, I will spill the beans and everybody will know that you're a gay man and you will be discharged. So apparently, or oh, since you are liable to be blackmailed, you are not allowed to serve in the army. The truth is that a practice of normative inequality, I discriminate you, I don't let gay men serve in the army, make them unequal, make them more vulnerable than others to blackmail. But this is too easy. I mean, this is really too easy. I don't want even to, this would be unworthy of your brain. Uh, it's more interesting the other side of the question, uh, lack of morality. Now, military morality, Martial morality is very often about courage, to be brave, yes, of course, which is not an easy subject, by the way, and integrity. Integrity means sincerity, to say what you think, to think what you say. Uh, uh, that is in all uh, military cultures. Yamamoto Tsunetomo in his Agakure would recommend his samurai to to act in public, this, in, 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 when in his private life, in, in the solitude of his lonely room, the same way he would act in front of many people, in front of many aristocrats, of many damnio. And in martial arts, in Kagate Shotokan, Itotsu Makoto no Michio, Mamogokoto, the first things you should be sincere, authentic. That is, you know, is. is well, the problem is that in our culture, since Aristotle, uh, Nicomachean ethics, uh, virtues do not, does not flourish in a vacuum. The only way to become brave, Aristotle says, is to practice courage. If you want to get the ethos with a long e, eta, the ethos from ethics, ethos uh, of courage, you need to perform several acts of brave action, which means you need to get the habit, uh, ethos with short e, epsilon, ethos, just the habit of performing brave actions. Performing those actions, you will get this habit, this ethos, lofty, lofty uh, concept of bravery, of courage. However, if I forbid you to practice virtue, if I forbid you to be sincere, if I'm telling you, you have to lie, you cannot come out, you are homosexual, you, you have to lie to the psychologist which will going to interview you, you are to going to lie with your comrades in arms, you, are to going, you, are going, you must lie to your superior in the command chain, well, I'm preventing you from practicing a virtue. And that will turn you into a sneaky character, in somebody who is not used to be sincere uh, and authentic and that thinks what he says and says what he thinks. He will turn this person into something unequal, less virtuous. So apparently you say, oh, yeah, my concern for inequality. Since you lack moral virtues, you are unequal. I cannot treat you equally. I have to forbid you from ser to serve in the army. But the truth is that forbidding you to serve in the army as a gay man, I make sure that you kind of run the risk of almost becoming inferior. So that is kind of interesting. However, it works perfectly with equality as well. Let us suppose, you will understand very easily that is not a supposition, 
that a racist scientist, maybe a famous one, checks the IQ of African-American uh, students and finds out that, in the average, is lower than uh, the IQ of white students. Uh, and then he claims, from basic, from, from basic inequality to normative inequality, it is not worth to try to help these people to enroll in the programs of the College of, of Medical School or the School of Law or whatever. It's not worth it. They cannot make it. Let us assume, for the sake of the argument, you will quickly understand that I'm not assuming anything at all. Uh, it was a reference to the Bell Curve book, of course. Uh, let us assume that those black kids which were adopted into British white families score very well at the same IQ test because you know, living in a neighborhood far from violence, spending a lot of time in socializing activi activities supervised by adults, intelligent toys, some travel, makes a huge difference in that plastic organ that is a brain. So let us say that thanks to an affirmative program, affirmative action program, I have some black African-American students enrolled in the School of Law and in the medical school. They will have a nicer job. They will make money. They will move into a nicer neighborhood. And his or her children will score way better in the same test. You see what happened from a normative practice of equality, affirmative action, I get a basic equality in, from the relevant point of view, the same IQ test. I don't believe in IQ tests, by the way, but never mind, doesn't matter. So it works perfectly with equality. This is a key issue. We must be very careful what we, when we speak of subsubjects, because a lot is at stake. A lot is at stake. Uh, and so, yes, I, I use inequality because it's easier and because we are facing um, the migration and refugee crisis. But it works perfectly even for equality. But, uh, uh, I take issues only one, with one section of your observation, which are, you know, you're smart as a weep. I, I was dreading this moment. Uh, is that. Uh, uh, I prefer the itinerary from normative uh, equality to basic equality. Oh, no. I just think that to focus only on one of them it can be misleading. I'm simply advocating for the complexity of this notion. And the reason I'm advocating uh, for the complexity of this notion is that I believe that to simplify problems here is the quickest way to uh, attack the European value of equality. Just say, you know, it's utopian, it's impossible. Because let us face it, uh, equality is a little different from, from a rhetorical point of view. We never say there is too much justice. Even if in theology there can be the competitive value of mercy toward justice, we never say there is too much dignity. Even if I remember that dignity has been conceptualized even as a hierarchical problem in a famous worship, but it has been said there is too much equality. It has been said, well, equality, you know, too much of a good thing. Yeah, no, too much of a good thing is wonderful because equality is just a therapy. And you are quite right. Uh, I didn't mention which is a triggering factor. So why should we? Act. Why should we, after all, uh, take seriously uh, normative practice to begin with? You know, it's so wonderful uh, the way Vico explains it. He says in his wonderful, convoluted, but beautiful Baroque Italian that the plebeians, after many centuries of submission, se ne dovettero attediare they must have grown wary of it. 
Yeah, I, I mean, it's not that they studied the problem, you know, pursuing John Rawls' a theory of justice and comparing it with political liberalism. You know, they simply couldn't stand it anymore. There was something about being crushed by the patricians. It was a new, not human condition, and they reacted to that. And it is more than enough. Although it's not founded on a metaphysical argument, although it can be analytical proved uh, till the very end uh, in an exhaustive way, yes, it is perfectly reasonable to feel bad about a state of unfair submission, even if you cannot completely explain what it is, uh, why, why, why it is unfair, and to react to it with a practice. And I believe that very often when we do react to the migrant crisis, we first and foremost react like this. We are not going to let people, for instance, draw in the sea. There is something obscene and unacceptable about that. There is a point of view from which there is equality. We draw the same way. We are back to Shylock. And the triggering factor is a perception. It's not unreasonable, but is not metaphysically founded. There is no analytical foundation from that. And Vico is very clear, it's not needed, because he says human beings do not like being crushed. But I may add that sometimes, even people who are not submitted, crushed, unfairly treated, uh, feel kind of uncomfortable to see other fellows uh, facing such dire circumstances. And from this point of view, yes, equality is equalitas equans, because of course, each time is different. You know, there cannot be the perfect set of equality. We have to face it, if I am right, of course, maybe I'm wrong, because I will perceive as particularly intense uh, a specific kind of inequality. I remember there is, uh, it's not mentioned in the paper, of course. I remember there is a wonderful uh, uh, page by Theodor Wiesegrund Adorno. And he says, sometimes uh, German refugee in America say, well, Hitler is a pathological case. And he says, it could be true, it is probably true, but it sounds so irrelevant in face of the magnitude of what the Fuhrer is doing and did. So in that moment, uh, you know, it could have been analytically true that uh, uh, not just Jewish people, but everybody should be respected. But the normative equality practice should have been we should not allow Jewish people to be slaughtered this way because the problem in that moment was that. And of course, wrong people, and of course, uh, gay and, and lesbian people. But now, I believe that the current migrant and refugee crisis has a kind of uh, emblematic value, because it's their problem that is summoning us. I'm taking too time, too much? Yes. So, you know, I will reply to the first part of your, of your, of your, of your question a little later in order to, let, to, to make some room for other questions. But thank you very much, uh, Nicola. It, it was a fascinating uh, way of discussing cruelly but fairly my paper. Thank you. Thank you again, but um, I'd like to open the debate. Uh, we have still time. Uh, does anyone have... Okay, thank you. Uh, so maybe it's a question for both of you because when I was listening to your discussion on equality, I couldn't help thinking about Samuel Moyne's, uh, Samuel Moyne's last book, you know, Not Enough Human Rights in an Equal World, because actually in his conclusions, he used precisely the same example you used a few, um, uh, a few minutes ago. The example of Croesus, you know, he imagines a man who owns everything, uh, but um, who owns everything, but still respects individual liberties and gives to to his people all what is needed 
to lead a, a, a decent life, it means education, health and holidays. Uh, and for him, this, uh, this example shows that uh, perfect respect for human rights can perfectly, this is his argument, not mine, but that per perfect respect for human rights can coexist with extreme inequality and actually as you know, maybe he goes on to argue that in the last 20 years, uh, uh, growing inequality has gone hand in hand with uh, greater respect for human rights. And he more or less accused, not like this, but he more or less accused human rights of distracting us from uh, social justice. So uh, I disagree personally with his argument, but I, I don't think it's so easy to rebuke it. And it's quite influential all day, so I would be curious to know how you would both uh, respond to it. I think maybe, we, yeah, we, 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 exactly. We collect the question and then, please. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I have a question which uh, no doubt might apply to every single uh, presentation at uh, this conference, which is uh, the following. What is specifically European about uh, the uh, notion, the value of uh, equality uh, that uh, you discussed uh, as spelled out in the various articles that fall under this heading? Could uh, all this not be asserted uh, uh, in the same, so in, maybe in different form, but with the same sort of force uh, in the United States, in Canada, in India, maybe even in Japan? Um, isn't this, in a way, a way of spelling out uh, this notion of free and equal uh, citizen described by uh, Tocqueville when uh, exploring uh, America at the beginning of uh, the 19th century? So should the title of this conference not have been American Values in the European Charter of Fundamental Rights? Thank you very much for the fascinating talk, uh, Martin Delex from the Sorbonne. And my question is almost a follow-up on Justine Lacroix's question, but I, I think the, what you explained about equality, the, the way you approach equality as a process against inequality, turns it into a powerful critical tool of extreme forms of poverty. So it seems to imply that they are illegitimate forms of poverty. My question would be, are there illegitimate forms of wealth from that approach? Are there in illegitimate forms of wealth, of extreme wealth, that, or relative wealth, not extreme wealth, but relative wealth that would not be sustainable, that would be criticized by this sort of processual uh, or approach of inequalities? Thank you. Uh, one question for Professor Zanetti. Thank you very much for your insightful and most interesting talk. Uh, like this, okay. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, ask your opinion on a point about equality and Europe now. Uh, uh, I would like to ask your opinion on the point of equality and uh, Europe nowadays. And so I would like to, to, to have your answer about what you say that um, fundamental rights-based system, like the European one, tries to translate what you called the Western notion of equality, because I, I would underline Western, into a reform system of limited and, most of all, I would say, judicially questionable inequality practices decided by states, or looking at the migrant border issue, would you say that such a model still keeps the borderline between uh, formal or substantial uh, basic and normative inequality in the hands of sovereign states in the end, and I finish, would it sound too extreme to you to say that formal and substantial basic and normative equality are still matters of sovereignty? Sovereignty. Can I ask a question? Uh, it's just a clarification. Uh, is your account a descriptive 
claim. Is your account a descriptive claim of how this itinerary actually works, or it's a normative claim of how we should see at this itinerary? Because on the one hand, if it is a, a claim of how this itinerary actually works, I see a problem because you made the example of affirmative action. Uh, let's say, for example, pink quotas in Italy. Uh, why should we start these pink quotas in the first place if we don't believe that women and men are actually equal? And in the second place, uh, if it is a normative claim, uh, does it have the risk of, let's say, exacerbating inequalities in order to activate those practices that then lead to formal equality? Thank you. Um, if it, okay, no. Uh, if it is a normative claim of how we should look at this itinerary, can it, can it have the risk of let's say, exacerbating those inequalities in order to uh, activate those practices and then lead to formal equality. Okay, uh, I shall try to be as quick as I can. La, verit la, la brevità gran pregio, says Rodolfo in La Bohème. Uh, and I will start from you. Uh, you see, that is one of uh, Vico's issues. Why should we? Well, we just feel bad about that. We perceive it as an injustice. Uh, you may not believe that women are like men, but I perceive myself equal to you. I will fight your position. And this fight uh, is itself, uh, this commitment is in itself uh, an equality practice. I advocate a notion of equality first and foremost as a practice. Nothing new, by the way. It is implied in several Logic of the critical race theory movement all the way back to the 90s. So it's really, it's really my friend Kendall Thomas would agree on this point. It's old, it's old stuff. But yes, we, there will be people who don't believe in equal opportunities for men and women, but there will be people who will fight for that. And the interesting point is that it works. I remember there was a strong resistance in admitting women in the military academy. After two or three years that we had them, nobody will, was questioning their presence anymore. I, I will tell you something more. The first year, the first two years, males were very nice with women kind of, oh, we, we shall help you because you need our help, you are so weak. After a while, you wouldn't want to mess with those ladies in a dark alley, I'm telling you. After a couple of years, there was no such unrequested help going on anymore because they were very high in the hierarchy. They would get very good grades, okay? So, you know, it works like that. You perceive something as unfair, as unequal treatment, and you react uh, uh, creating an equality as a practice. Now, the deadly question is uh, the one, what is European about this equality? Why is not American and is not Canadian and is not maybe Indian? That is el velen del argumento, would say Father Dante Alighieri, the poison of the argument. Well, there are little differences, for instance, even with the American, I, I mentioned uh, 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 the, the Thomas Jefferson's uh, Declaration of Independence, and there it looks like well, there is just basic equality, and from that basic equality, men are equal because they were created 
equal, uh, you know, we get the rights and this and that. While, I, you know, I'm, I'm advocating that in the European tradition, there is also something different hidden, but this different itinera uh, conceptual itinerary, the recognition of uh, uh, equality as a practice, of normative equality as a cause, as a prius, not as an end result. Now, it's much more difficult to get involved in the hot debate about Asian values and Western colonizing attitude in the field of legal and political philosophy. There was a huge debate about that. There were scholars who claimed and who still claim human rights are just a Western, uh, European and United States kind of category. We don't truly identify ourselves in that. Several kind of replies have been offered to this very strong argument. You, you, you touched an amazingly poisonous uh, uh, nest of wasps. But my favorite one is that those who uh, attack this European notion of equality commit a so-called performative contradiction. You, you know, it's, it sounds terrible, it's very easy. Um, Robert Alexi used very famously this concept several times, but I want to make things really easy. What is a performative contradiction? Uh, uh, for, for reasons that none of you should be interested in, I once needed to learn to dance, to waltz and to polka, and I, I was not able, and I went to take classes, and I was the worst uh, disciple of Maestro Goncarati. I was very slow, I was very awkward, I was goofy, and he would reproach me and would yell at me and would say, Professor, you should just, you should just think too much. Just let it go, just follow the music. Be spontaneous, you cannot be like this. I order you, be spontaneous. And uh, yeah, it was so ashamed, it was such a public shame that I took shelter in my field and I replied, Maestro Roncarati, if I'm spontaneous because you order me to be, is a performative contradiction, is no longer spontaneity to begin with. And he replied, I'm keeping you only because you paid for six months, uh, because that was just too much for him. That is a performative contradiction. Now, if I claim you are colonizing my culture, trying to uh, push down my throat this kind of equality, I'm making use of the same exact notion of equality I'm advocating for. Meaning, hey, you are going against the equality between cultures, which imply a form of some kind of basic equality. You run the risk of using against me a weapon which can be deadly for you too, because you are making use of a notion of equality which is exactly the one I'm advocating for. So from my point of view, maybe European equality is just one concept, concept among many others. From my point of view, maybe uh, European equality is very much situated and must be acknowledged as such. But what I claim is that since if I face some kind of unacceptable inequality, I react with a practice of normative uh, equality, well, situated as it can be, that is. That is what I'm saying. I react to a situated case of unequal treatment. I react to something I can stand so that while you are telling me your notion of equality is perfectly situated, you are also a fortiori uh, stating my own point. Yes, it's exactly what I'm doing. It's exactly what I'm doing. One last point. I know it must be very quick, just two minutes. Yes, the whole point, people here understood very, very well and very quickly that, that, that uh, I, I used, I wanted to, to, to 
make equality look as complex as I could, so first I blurred the distinction between formal equality and substantial equality, and then I added to the usual itinerary from basic equality to normative equality a possible alternative itinerary to make things more complex and maybe more interesting. Uh, but as far as the problem of wealth is concerned, the whole point, which is basically restating the obvious, I said it very clearly, the whole point was, can we bracket away the notion of a line in the sand? Can we bracket away as irrelevant the notion that not all inequalities is acceptable? Can we truly believe, for any yeah. reason, it doesn't have to be a, a, a fetishism about formal equality. I perfectly agree with you. There are several ways to show that uh, substantial distributive justice equality is uh, worth per se, is a value per se. I fully agree with that, but can we truly break it away? Because you see very often, and this is exactly what's going on, sometimes we do not realize that equality is a complex category that kind of will bounce back to us if we not take into consideration that some particularly, specifically high cases of inequality can destroy the whole fabric of the notion. Uh, there will be so much to add, but I want you to have the last word, Nicola. Yeah, I will be very quick. Uh, as regards uh, Justine's uh, question, I, of course, uh, uh, I agree. I think that human rights are not the whole of justice, as, uh, and so uh, th there are other dimensions of, and I think this is a big problem in m much of the literature of, on inequality nowadays, that too often you get the impression that they're not about inequality, but about poverty, while inequality is something else. Amartya Sen's books are a clear example of that. Uh, they are not about inequality or about the impact of inequality as regards poverty, not inequality per se. And, but I have some few words to say uh, in answering to Philip's question because we discussed a lot when deciding how to, uh, which title to give to this conference and also to our little book on, about the phrase European values. How do we understand the idea of European values? I can provide two quick uh, answer to this question. One is, one is more controversial. Is the idea that, free maybe, one is controversial. Is the idea that these values were originated in European culture, probably in a very different way as we understand them nowadays, because after being originated in Europe, they were adopted also by other cultures, and in this process they were re-elaborated and uh, through a process of intercultural and reciprocal influences between culture. But this is a controversial issue. There are people claiming that in the very traditional culture of Asia, Asia or other countries, you can find precise, very similar ideas of equality and so on. The second question, answer is that they are European values because they are the European, the values that Europe today endorses and affirms, not because they cannot be conceived as universal or not being able to be realized in other part, but in its uh, basic do normative documents, uh, they are the values that are affirmed. The third answer is that uh, probably which, what is specifically European is not how each single values is conceived, uh, but about about the set of all the values and uh, how they relate to each other. So uh, I think that the main distinction, for instance, between the United States and Europe is uh, about the relationship and the weighting between freedom and equality and solidarity, not about the very same notion of freedom, equality, and solidarity per se. Per se. That's okay. Thank you.